Hi, this is Michael Altos, and we're continuing our discussion of antimicrobial agents, and this is part two. The first set of antibiotics we're going to discuss are the cell wall or cell membrane agents. These are, these are antibiotics that kill cells, which means they are bactericidal, and they do so by interfering with cell wall synthesis. Usually they're used against gram-positive bacteria. And we're going to start by talking about drugs like penicillin. The broad-spectrum penicillins have anaerobic coverage as well as coverage against pseudomonas. So penicillins are beta-lactams. And let's just look at our diagram, which shows the beta-lactam ring, this four-membered ring right over here. This is the beta-lactam ring. And then the beta-lactams have side chains on different parts of the antibiotic. Beta-lactams include penicillin, amoxicillin, nafcillin, and many others. Bacteria can develop resistance to penicillins through a number of interesting mechanisms. They can create a substance known as beta-lactamases, which cleave the beta-lactam ring and inactivate the antibiotic. They have, they are, they have the ability to generate penicillin binding proteins, which bind to the penicillin and pump it back out of the cell. And they have other ways of changing flow of drug into the cell or increasing pumping of the drug out of the cell. Now we said that one method of resistance is for bacteria to synthesize beta-lactamase. So in turn, we have designed beta-lactamase inhibitors, which overcome the resistance mechanism from beta-lactamase. And these are antibiotic combinations that you may be familiar with. They include unison, zosin, and augmentin. Each of them contains a penicillin, in these cases ampicillin, piperacillin, and amoxicillin, together with a beta-lactamase inhibitor, sulbactam, tazobactam, and clavulanic acid. There are many adverse reactions to penicillins. They include hypersensitivity reactions, as we discussed before, like anaphylaxis, rash, or fever. Patients can have delayed drug reactions, which include rash and fever, and they can have non-allergic mediated reactions like GI upset, nausea and vomiting, and overgrowth of the bacteria Clostridium difficile, which can lead to a C. diff condition in the patient. There are other beta-lactams besides penicillin. The next that we're going to discuss, and the ones that you most commonly administer probably, are cephalosporins. Cephalosporins come in a number of different generations. And I've given a few examples, but there are really dozens of different cephalosporins. So cephazolin, or ANCEF, or Kefsol, is a first generation. Cefuroxime is a second generation. Cefoxetin is also second generation. Ceftriaxone is third generation, and cefepime is a fourth generation. Cephalosporins are very similar to penicillins, although they tend to be a little bit more stable. And they provide excellent antibiotic coverage for skin flora. And as a result, since skin flora are one of the most common causes of surgical site infections, cephalosporins are excellent choices for cardiovascular, orthopedic, biliary, pelvic, and intra-abdominal surgeries. As we move from first generation to higher generations, we see more gram-negative coverage in, a distant, in addition to gram-positive coverage. And so this is beneficial in GI and some neuro cases. We also see a little bit more resistance to beta-lactamases and better, better penetration of the blood-brain barrier, making them more appropriate for neurological procedures. Resistance to cephalosporins occurs through many of the same mechanisms as we saw with penicillins, and adverse reactions are also similar, although anaphylaxis tends to be much less common with cephalosporins. Cephazolin, as we said, that's ANCEF or Kefsol, is the, by far the most common beta-lactam that we give. Its dose is one gram every three to four hours. We use two grams if they weigh more than 80 kilograms, and many institutions are now using three grams 
when the patient weighs more than 120 kilograms or their BMI is above 40. In children, we dose it at 25 milligrams per kilogram up to a maximum dose of 2 grams. Many people are aware that beta-lactams, because they are, or rather, many people are aware that cephalosporins, because they are beta-lactams, may have cross-reactivity with penicillins. And this is an issue when we talk about penicillin allergy. So the question is, are patients who are allergic to penicillins able to get cephalosporins or not? And this is a controversial topic. First of all, we have to be aware that most patients who say they are allergic to penicillin are not actually allergic to penicillin. Many patients had some other sort of adverse drug reaction, whether it was nausea and vomiting or GI upset or a drug rash or a fever. On the other hand, patients who do have a true penicillin allergy are three times more likely to have allergic reactions to other drugs, even non-related drugs. Finally, to confuse the issue even further, some older data which said that 10% of patients who have penicillin allergy will be allergic to cephalosporins, that data was based on formulations of cephalosporin that had penicillin contaminants inside the, med the medication. So it's very hard to get a clear answer about whether we can give cephalosporins to patients who are allergic to penicillin. Here's a chart that shows a penicillin molecule. You can see that penicillins have the beta-lactam ring. They have this acyl side chain with some kind of R group on the end and this thiazolidine ring on the other side. If we look at all the penicillin derivatives, what we're looking at over here are the different R groups, which can be as simple as penicillin itself, which has a methyl group followed by a benzene ring, ampicillin, which is slightly more complex, all the way to piperacillin and some of these others, which have very complicated side chains. On the right side, we see a cephalosporin. It has the same beta-lactam group, we see to the right it has a six-membered ring instead of a five-membered ring. And it also has three different side chain groups. And we can look at what the different side chains are for all of the different antibiotics we use. If we analyze this slide, we can learn a lot of interesting information. First, we see that there are certain cephalosporins that have very similar side chains to penicillins. For example, look at ampicillin and cephalexin. We can also see that there's a common misconception that cephalexin or keflex and cefazolin or kefsol are just oral and IV versions of each other. But we can see from the side chains that they are wildly different. And this chart, this table rather, shows in the vertical columns different antibiotics that may have some similar side chain cross-reactivity. So we see cefoxetin being similar to penicillin, cephalexin being most similar to amoxicillin and ampicillin, and cefazolin being pretty much by itself compared to the other common beta-lactams. In fact, cefazolin is one of the most unlikely antibiotics to cross-react with any other beta-lactam. So let's cut to, some take, cut to the chase and talk about some take-home points. The first point is that not, cephalosporin, not all cephalosporins are the same. Cefzol is not, kefzol is not the same as keflex. And I see surgeons and anesthesiologists making this mistake almost every day. The second point we want to understand clearly is that it is probably safe to give cephalosporins to patients who have minor penicillin allergy. And the reason is because most allergic reactions are not to the beta-lactam group, but rather to the side chain. So as long as the side chains are different, the chances of a cross-reaction is very low. And so in patients who have minor allergic reactions, it's certainly safe to try a different beta-lactam. 
but since there is some question that they could have an allergic reaction to the beta-lactam group itself, it's reasonable to avoid giving cephalosporins to patients who have anaphylaxis to penicillin. And this is my practice, that patients who tell me that they have swelling or anaphylaxis or stopped breathing when they got a penicillin, I don't give them cephalosporins. Patients who describe rash, hives, itching, GI upset, or any other mild reaction, I usually go ahead and give them a cephalosporin. That's it for our discussion of beta-lactams, but there are other drugs that affect cell wall. The next, and also a very common drug that we give, is vancomycin. Vancomycin also inhibits cell wall synthesis, and therefore it's effective mostly against gram-positive bacteria. But it's not as effective as cephalosporins against skin flora. And this is an important choice, uh, an important point for us to understand. Because there are patients who are colonized with a bacteria called methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. That's the famous MRSA. Now, if you look on the patient's cultures, you won't actually see methicillin listed. You'll see oxicillin listed. So really, these patients have oxicillin-resistant Staph aureus, but we still call it MRSA. Patients who have MRSA will not respond to cephalosporins, and so we give them vancomycin instead. But let's be clear, vancomycin is effective against MRSA, but it is not as effective against the other skin flora as cephalosporins. And so most infectious disease physicians recommend that patients should get cephalosporins as a protection against surgical site infection, and that we should add but not replace the cephalosporins. We should add vancomycin in patients who also have MRSA. Patients can become resistant to vancomycin due to modification of the binding site on the bacteria. And the dose of vancomycin is currently 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram IV, given every 8 to 12 hours. In some patients, especially those with renal disease, we check what's called a vancomycin trough, which means before we redose, we draw blood and check the serum level to see if their vancomycin levels are low enough. In patients who have renal disease, we have to modify dosing because otherwise we can accumulate quite a bit of vancomycin in the patient. Vancomycin can also be given orally, in which case it is not effective against systemic infections, but it's effective against C. diff colitis, which occurs in the GI tract. Adverse reactions from vancomycin include fever and chills, irritation, and ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity, which is somewhat rare, but underscores the reason that we sometimes check vancomycin levels before we redose. Red man syndrome is commonly associated with vancomycin. This is a classic example of an anaphylactoid reaction. It is a non-immune mediated histamine release that occurs in a dose-dependent fashion, actually a rate-dependent fashion, when vancomycin is given too quickly. And for that reason, we should always give vancomycin on a pump over the course of one hour. Finally, just to round out the discussion, we have daptomycin, which is good for vancomycin-resistant bacteria. So basically, it's only effective against gram-positive bacteria. I usually give it as a slow bolus, and it is an expensive drug. You may or may not have occasion to give daptomycin, but it is out there. Carbapenems, which include meropenem and imipenem, are also beta-lactam medications. They're effective mostly against gram-negative bacteria as well as some anaerobic and pseudomonas bacteria. They have a lower risk of allergy in patients who have a penicillin allergy, especially if the reaction is just a rash. Well, that's plenty to discuss for this section. Really, we focused on beta-lactam drugs and other cell wall targeted drugs. Please let me know if you have any questions about the material. And we'll continue with the rest of the antibiotics in the next lecture.